Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the CKC channel. I'm your host, Fiery Master Calvin Klaassen, and uh, welcome to another special edition of Reflections. Um, yes, guys, so we're getting close to the end of the year and of the reflection season. Uh, I think this is the third last episode, if I'm correct. Uh, good evening, everyone. Skanda, Earl, I, welcome, guys. Um, yes. So, very special guest this evening. He's been playing chess for a very, very long time. We've advertised uh, as well that he's a seven-time SA champion. So, we'll have to learn more about this. And um, I've played him quite a lot. Uh, okay, a relative amount of times. And every time I play him, I thoroughly enjoy it, whether whatever the result may be. So, um, I can also add that he's... he's, he's his style of play is very aesthetically pleasing to me, at least. So, um, yeah, I think we can. Um, oh, yeah, just just a reminder, guys. Throw in your your questions. You don't want to miss out on this one. So please throw in your questions early as possible, so that you don't your questions don't get missed. And we are also going to do some game analysis afterwards. So we need to budget our budget our time properly. Um, if you haven't yet pressed the follow button, if you're new to the show, press the follow button to enable chat. chat. If you have not um, pressed the follow button, then you will notice you can't uh, chat with us. So please make sure to, to hit the follow button. Okay, so now um, I think we will go over. Let's just make sure everything is in order. Yeah, so um, let's just that. Okay, so let's go over to uh, the Reflections uh, Library with uh, Dr. Boa. Over to you. Good evening, Calvin, and good evening, viewers. Uh, it's great to be here in November at uh, with uh, Mr. Charles de Villiers. He's a good friend of, of mine, and he has won the South African Close Championship six times, as well as the SA Open. And uh, tonight, Charles has agreed uh, to be interviewed uh, by myself and by you as, as the viewers. Uh, Charles, welcome to, to the Reflections. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Charles, thank you very much. And um, when I did my research, I discovered that you've been playing chess for a very, very long time. Charles, how did it all start initially? Well, it all started initially when I, I found that I was off school for a while. Um, I had a, a, a back operation when I was about uh, 14 and I had a lot of time on my hands. I spent some time in the library and somehow I'm discovered the chess section and also that there was a chess club that, that met right there in the library. So um, one thing led to another. My goodness. And, and Charles, then you must have had a very quick rise to, to the top because you were playing at the World Juniors at, uh, in the early 1970s. Can, uh, can you recall uh, where that uh, event took place? Yes, it was in Athens. Um, it, was, it was very exciting. It was basically it was my first my first adventure overseas. Um, and uh, I met some of the uh, future grandmasters, of course. Um, Zoltan Ribley, Rafael Vaganian, uh, Kenneth Rogoff, who's now become something big in, I think, in the World Bank, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, yeah in the World Bank. And um, yes, of course, I didn't, I didn't follow in their footsteps, but, but at least I had a chance to play some of them and uh, meet some of them. And uh, it was a, it was a, a fun tournament. Um, well, Charles, I mean, that that was a fantastic opening there because one of the things that uh, I discovered, because I probably discovered you uh, when I watched chess on television on a Sunday morning when you were playing Grandmaster Miguel Quinteros. And that's when I first came across the name. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Uh, how did it come about that you were playing Grandmaster Quinteros on TV on a Sunday uh, in South Africa? It was rather strange. Um, it, was a, it was a transport company, I think, that was sponsoring it. And in those days, um, okay, there wasn't a lot going on on TV on Sundays. So I think I think even even a, a chess match was regarded as, as something that they could they could use to to, to fill the airwaves. Um, and Quinteros uh, was visiting South Africa, and um, so we we managed to set up set up this match. I think there was a, there was another sponsor as well, um, and uh, we both had to wear tuxedos. 
Um, okay. You know, the person playing white wore a white tuxedo and, and his opponent wore a black tuxedo. And right. uh, the whole thing was designed to be quite sort of uh, television friendly. And I believe we had um, one of the O'Sullivan's commentating. I think it was, I think it was Michael. Was oh, Michael, yes. Yes, no, I, I do recall some of the commentary. But Charles, before we get to 1987, I mean, um, one of the interesting things is that you played for South Africa at the 1974 Olympiad. Um, can, you, can you recall what was your first experience at, at that Olympiad? Because, of course, later on you played at more Olympiads, but uh, what was your experience like in 74? Well, of course, it was all, it was all very new to me then. Um, and uh, I was learning a lot of it as I, as I went along. So, so um, I had some, some decent games and some less less impressive games, but, but um, I, I had a lot of fun and uh, I really enjoyed visiting Nice. And, and, um, and, and, and Charles, you, you, you went on to study in France a bit, I believe. Yes. I've had a bit of a connection with, with France um, from, from very early on because my, my um, father was a di diplomat in the diplomatic service in, in Paris. Um, so they lived, they lived in France for four years and I went to school in England, but I also uh, visited them in, in France. And so I always felt I had a little bit of a, an entree. Of course, and with your surname naturally as, as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, 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 end up back in France. <laughs> no, excellent. But now, Charles, it, um, uh, many people would, would say that in the decades, 19, in the 70s and 80s, you won six South African close championships. And, and just for the viewers to understand the significance of that, is that the close took place every two years, which meant that effectively you were dominating chess probably from about 75 to, to 1990, effectively at, at that stage uh, in South Africa. How did you do it to, to be such a consistent player in, in those years and obviously beyond? But tell us about those first uh, few SA clothes. I mean, winning six SA clothes, it's, it's not easy, I know. Well, um, some of them were, were a little more, a little easier than others. If I could put it that way, that not the, not not the, anything was easy, but but um, there were some essay clothes where I, I just managed to squeak in at the last moment, um, and somehow somehow at least get a share of the title. I shared the title quite a lot. Um, I shared with uh, David Walker. I shared with Pip Crone. I shared with Clyde Wolpe. I shared with all, all kinds of people. So it wasn't just me. Um, yes. Well, but you, you shared in 75 with Pete Cruen, and in mm -hmm. 77 was David Walker, 85 was Clyde Walpy, and then there were there were three that you won on your own. Okay, all right. I'll take a word for it. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have all the records in front of me, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that, but Charles, uh, um, how do you maintain a, how did you maintain a high standard? Did you have a, uh, did you train a lot? Was it one hour a day? What was your secret uh, uh, during those times? I have to admit, I didn't really train a lot. I, I, I would play a lot. I was very, very keen on studying chess when I was when I was at, of school age, and maybe a little bit beyond that. But um, since then, I've tended to be a bit lazy. I, I think I've always been a bit lazy. So um, I tend to go on instinct rather than, rather than on study. And would you, would you say your practical play has assisted you throughout? Because, I mean, you, you were a player that did not hesitate to play in tournaments, open tournaments, Swiss tournaments, etc. Would you say that that has assisted you? I'm sure that helped, yeah. That, that and the fact that I actually enjoyed doing that. So um, I, was, I was very um, keen to play in, in, in tournaments. And I'm sure that didn't um, hurt my results because it, it was, you know, uh, Actually, actually enjoying the experience, I think, is, is an important part of, of playing good chess. Well, I think that that's very important, just to enjoy oneself at the board and, and know that it's, it's your passion. Charles, mm -hmm. we, if you think back to those, let's call it the first uh, 75 to, to 1981, um, who was your toughest opponent in those years? Well, at, the, at that stage, the, the, the two top players in the country were, were um, Kroen and Frequent. Um, 
Yes. And Pit they, Pit Cronin and, and, and David Friedgood. Um, they had shared the title between them a number of times. I'm not sure exactly how many times, but um, they basically the, the, the title would ping pong between them and they, that, that was the great rivalry of, of those years. So it was quite, quite exciting for me to be able to break into that um, duopoly um, yeah. When, yeah. That, when that eventually happened. But that was, I think, only my third South African closed. Um, I, so there was a, there was a learning, learning process involved. Of, of course. And, uh, but, but Charles, from, uh, it, it seemed to me from about um, uh, the late 70s, probably 81, you started dominating quite frequently. I mean, winning 81, 85, 87, and 89 means that you won four out of the, out of the five clothes that was held in the decade of the 80s. So that, that was probably a, a, high, a highlight of your career. I suppose so. Yes, yeah, um, it's it's a pity that 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 also coincided with the with South Africa's isolation internationally. Um, yeah, and you know there wasn't. Uh, it, I certainly certainly enjoyed enjoyed playing chess domestically in, in all that time. But it would have been nice to be able to play play a little more internationally in, in those years. Mm -hmm. Well, some, some would say that if uh, you did play internationally, Charles, that you would probably have played at, at, at Grandmaster uh, level stand or, or standard. Would you, would you agree with that sentiment? No, not really. Um, I mean, I, it's, 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 easy, it's too easy to say that kind of thing. Um, but I, you know, I think the only way to become a Grandmaster or to, to get credit for being a Grandmaster is actually to, to get there. Um, I don't think one can say, that, well, I might have been, you know, I could have been a contender. Um, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't work that way. You, okay, you've got, got to do it, and if you don't do it, then then it doesn't count. Well, I, but I would argue though that uh, you would probably have, uh, if you had had more opportunities, you'd probably be be even stronger than than than, than what you were, uh, having only played in South Africa. But uh, so it just as you said, it coincided. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, sure. I mean, anybody anybody who gets international competition is get is get to. Um, improve, and I think there would be opportunities not just for me, but for for, for other other players to, to 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 do better if we if we'd had the that those openings. Charles, when uh, um, when South Africa did the reopen, uh, and uh, you were chosen to to be in the '92 Olympiad team, uh, how did you feel? Because you you were a member of the last Olympiad team in '74, and now you are also uh, a member of the '92 team. And and if, and and I was privileged to be a fellow teammate of yours in in that year. Uh, how did you feel being back in international chess in '92? Well, it was great, really. Um, you know, it was quite quite a strange feeling after after a lapse of twenty years to find myself suddenly back back in the back in the Olympiad team. Um, but uh, what can I say? It was it was a, it was an honour and a privilege. Charles, um, in the in the in the ninety four Olympiad, you you had an excellent score, and you probably missed the IM title by probably a whisker. Uh, how how did you how did you feel playing in Moscow in in ninety four? Because uh, Moscow obviously is just the home of chess and, and historically and emotionally most chess players would like to see that. How did you find Moscow in 94? Well, Moscow in 94 was a, was a kind of challenging place in some ways. Um, it, was, it was, first of all, it was extremely cold. It was middle of December and um, it was minus 20 outside sometimes. Um, we were staying in this very large um, Cosmos Hotel, which appeared to be doing duty as a kind of den of vice and a, um, a sort of arms dealers depot and all kinds of stuff was going on all around, all around us. And um, there were people who didn't want to leave the hotel at all. They thought Moscow itself was too dangerous. Um, but that wasn't, wasn't my experience. It, um, Moscow was pretty pretty cold and, and um, forbidding because what with not, not speaking the language and, and not really knowing where to go, but but it was it was a fascinating experience at the same time. And and Charles, the, your games it, it itself, you were you were playing uh, very very well. And in fact, in round one in in ninety four on stage, you drew with uh, Grandmaster Shabalov, who was probably uh, also at the height of his career at, at that stage, uh, playing for the United States. Um, do you still uh, recall that game a bit? 
I do a bit, yes. Um, I actually looked for it for, for, for today, but I, I was unfortunately un, unable to, to, to locate it. Um, I don't know if you have it in your archives, maybe. But... No, I, in fact, I do have it uh, in my archive, so I'll send it to you uh, uh, tomorrow as, as well. So uh, uh, for sure, Charles, uh, I've got quite a few of, of your games on, on that score. Um, Charles, I in the... I was surprised by that game. <laughs> well, I, one of the things that, that struck me about that game against Shabalov was that uh, when they interviewed uh, Shabalov later on, they asked him, how did he feel we, uh, to draw against a weaker player? And and your response was, who was the weaker player? I don't know if you recall uh, that no, conversation. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, And Charles, you, you were also in the Olympia team in 1998. Uh, you went to Chess City in uh, Kalmykia. That's right, and you, yes. How, how did you find uh, uh, that uh, that Chess City and the Olympiad? Well, it's very a very strange, surreal place. It's like it's like going to Disney World or something because um, the, you know there's nothing nothing real about it. Um, you're surrounded by what's basically quite a quite a poor South Asian country, and suddenly you come come upon this um, artificial collection of of buildings built just for chess by the by the local dictator. Um, but um, I think it was at that Olympiad that somebody approached me and said, um, did you perhaps have a father who played chess back in, back in 1974? <laughs> and <laughs> I no, actually, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that just shows you they 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 still remember the name of the Villiers from '74 as 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 well. And okay, and Charles, yes. if I if I look uh, at at my records, then I noticed you you went to Mozambique in 2018 to play in the zonals. Um, mm -hmm. So that, in my opinion, means that you've played international chess for at least 45 years. I suppose that must be right. Yes. And, but but Charles, you you've maintained a high standard, and I mean I I'd, I'd like you. Is it uh, besides your natural ability? Is it do you feel you have a, a feel for the pieces? Um, you know what? Do you play against the, the person, or do you play against the pieces? I play against the pieces. I think um, you know I have maybe some opponents who who seem easier for me to to, to play against than others. I, but I think I'm sure that's true for everybody. But um, I, I can't say that I really think about how my opponent is, is going to react during a game. I think I think about what what are the what are the pieces asking me to do. And and well, I can testify to that, Charles, because um, I must tell the viewers that I recently updated my database and I found that I have played against Charles de Villiers thirty five times. Charles, I don't know if I've been your opponent that you, that, that you have faced the most. <laughs> I must say, I was astonished when you told me that, uh, that, 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 that I had no idea that we played play that many times. If, we, if you'd asked me off the cuff, I would probably have said 10 times. But yeah. 35 is, quite, is quite, a, quite a record, yes. But I, I, I suppose that uh, when I looked at the sort of the, the, the calendar of, of the dates and those things, I realized that we actually played at least once a year against one another because we, we were playing in the Western Province events and in the league. And, mm -hmm. and, and in the Western Province League, Charles, you've, you've played for, for Claremont, you've played for Cape Town. Um, what has been your favorite uh, Western Province League experiences in, in these last few years? Oh, I don't know. Um, it's, the Western Province League has, has become a very different, very different place um, over the last few years because it's become huge, and of course, the, 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 all the games are played in the same in the same venue, which used not to be the case. Uh, at one stage, one, one would have to travel to, to 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 get to another club, and then uh, sometimes you couldn't find the venue, and the, or the, the other team didn't turn up, or there were all kinds of interesting interesting. Um, complications that arose. Um, whereas now it feels a lot more like, like a sort of one day tournament um, because there's, there are hundreds of people all, all together in a, in a huge room. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very different. And have you, in, have you enjoyed the, the Western Province League? On the whole, yes, yeah, yeah. Charles, how would you describe your style of play? Um, I think it's changed a bit. You know, I was looking at some of my old games and I, I realized that I was much more aggressive when I was younger. Um, so no, some would say you're still aggressive. 
Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, I try to be, but um, I seem to be I seem to be uh, somehow a little little more conservative in my approach to positions now, and it's probably not 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 a good thing because um, I don't know if it, if it's giving me the same kind of results that, that that I used to get. But of course, you know, we all get a little more more conservative as we get get older. I think. Yeah, that's that's probably true as as well, Charles. When when I played against you, uh, I noticed that um, you took your time over moves to consider moves, and and that you never played in a rushed manner or, or, or fashion. Was that always something that you had with within you that that you considered your moves and before you played it because you were still playing accurately even even when when you were down on on time in in the last five minutes, but you still had accuracy. What, what how would you you, uh, describe your thinking process um, during the game. Well, I think I think that's actually a vice of mine that that I've never I've never really um, at, at some stage I acquired the bad habit of of getting into too much time trouble, thinking too long over my moves, and um, it's a, it turned out to be a, a, a bad habit that's been very hard to break. Um, yeah, I, I, it's still it's still a weakness of mine. I still lose games on time, um, even in uh, blitz chess, I lose lots of games on time, and uh, it doesn't um, it certainly doesn't improve my results. But okay, at the same time, I have always been been a sort of uh, deliberate player. I tend tend not to play. I don't, I don't play quickly. I don't maybe have the, the natural sight of the ball that some people do. Um, and uh, but I used to do a little better in time trouble than I do yeah. these days. But, but Charles, would, would you say uh, you were searching for the perfect move or were you finding the best practical move or the move that would make your, your, opponents, your opponent uncomfortable? What would you describe that you look for in a position? I think, I think um, my problem is that I look for the perfect move. And um, often if there is a perfect move, it's not, it's not there to be found in the time available. So um, I... I Put too much time into trying to find the perfect move, and then uh, if the 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 perfect is the enemy of the good, I don't I might might end up either using way too much time to find my perfect move, or, or perhaps finding something which is not just imperfect but downright bad. Yes, yes, sir. I, and and I think uh, uh, because that has always been a discussion. I mean, I remember having discussions with Donovan van den Yeffer and Kenny Solomon, and and. Uh, they would say some players are practical players. They would play a move, even if it's not the best, just to gain time on the on the clock. But when I when I found uh, watching your games or playing against you that uh, in fact, as you said, the deliberate move and and one would know that if there was a move to find, you will find that particular move. Well, I'll try to find that particular move. I don't always find it, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the problem the problem remains the same. That it takes it sometimes takes too long to do that. Charles, uh, it, it seemed to me as if uh, you enjoyed your Sicilians and your and your King's Indians. It's just um, a function of not not really having spent enough time studying other things. Uh, it's laziness again. Um, I, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't really learned any other openings, so I just stick with the, the ones that I sort of know. But I mean, the, the Sicilian has brought you many fine victories. And of course, the King's Indian is, is, uh, was well known, I mean, uh, from Fisher's days. Um, and, and I would assume that, I mean, you coming from the Fisher era would have, and then obviously Kasparov also playing the King's Indian. Would you recommend that for, for young up and coming players uh, to, to study the King's Indian? Well, uh, it's hard, hard to say, really. Um, I seem to play a lot, a lot of King's Indians now, but, but um, <laughs> At one stage, I avoided it on the grounds that it was too, too well known, too theoretical. Um, so I would try to play other things, um, Minzos and and Queens Indians and things like that. Um, but that, for a long time now, I've I've just fallen back on the Kings Indian type of position as as something that is it's it's reasonably familiar to me and and um, I just know roughly what to do. Yes, uh, but I, I've always associated you with a with a G7 fianchetto and 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 playing playing from the uh, type of thing. So so that has been my experience as mm -hmm. as well. Um, Charles, you've played all over 
the world. You've played all over South Africa. What has been your favorite tournament? Beside the SA close that you won six times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, there've been there've been so many tournaments, Freddie. I played played in a great a great many tournaments, and it's um, it's hard to hard to single one out. Um, I suppose for very early on, I played in a Hermanas tournament. Um, they used to have a, have a weekend tournament there, and um, I really enjoyed that. Because it was, it was a relaxation as well as a tournament. It wasn't wasn't all that serious, um, and so that that was that was good fun. Yeah, no, I I I also recall in those uh, green SA chess magazines there was many tournaments, a chess congress in Hermanus, and then of course in the wilderness and and those places as uh, as well as as time was was elapsing. Charles, who in your opinion, who was the most famous opponent besides the ones that you mentioned, like Ribley and, and Rogoff and, and others in Athens? Who was um, the most famous player that you played against? Uh, well, I, I played against um, Spassky in a simultaneous. Um, you, you would qualify. You would certainly qualify. He's famous, but, but uh, yes, I can't, I can't report a good result, unfortunately. You <laughs> wiped the floor with me. Yes. Um, who else? I suppose, well, I have, I have played Hubner in a simultaneous as well. Yeah. Um, we drew that one. And um, in fact, it was a clock simultaneous. I think it was, a, it was, a, but he was, he was playing, I think, I think uh, four or five people simultaneously. Um, yeah. But I don't, I don't think I've played all that many famous players, not, not, a, not the world of East anyway. Um, and, 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 and Charles, the 1979 and, and 81 uh, events, the, the older Meester ones, where Korshnoi played and John Nunn. Were you involved in any of those? Uh, uh, did you play against uh, maybe some of them in Blitz or, or that type of thing at that time? No, I, was, I wasn't really involved in those, in those tournaments. I think I was, um, it, that must have been when I was out, out of the country studying. Um, okay. I think, I think when, when uh, Nunn and Korshnoi came, I was, I was in France. Okay, so, so yeah, so then, because uh, I, I noticed that um, in 79 and 81, uh, I mean, you were the champion of, of South Africa in 81 as well. So uh, you would have uh, seen him or met him as well. But a great result against Hubner, uh, of course. I mean, he was probably, they, they tell me, the world's strongest amateur chess player at the, <laughs> for a long time. Yes. Charles, um, I'm going to ask Calvin if the viewers have any questions for you from my side. Thank you very much. I still have one or two questions, but let's have the viewers ask one or two questions. So thank you from my side, Charles. Calvin, right, over you. to you. Right. Okay, guys, I'm back. Um, so let's see. Interesting stuff, guys. Um, and yeah, thanks to everybody for, for the questions thus far. So I'll start off with the, with the, the first question here um, from Cassie Chess. Um, Cassie is asking, Charles, how did you prepare for um, chess games back in the 80s and 90s? Did you have some routine? Uh, no, I wouldn't say I had a routine at all. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, um, the way one prepared for a chess game was to um, find the chess informant. And maybe to, um, the chess informant was, a, for, for those who don't know, um, was a kind of soft bound um, encyclopedia of, of chess games that was published, I think, twice a year. Um, but they were very expensive. And so after I invested in the first five or six of them, I decided I was, it, was, it was too much, it was too much money for the amount of effort I was actually putting in to the, okay. to the uh, like preparation. So um, I would always go back to those, those few that I had bought. Um, but but um, I wouldn't say I was ever a theoretician. Uh -huh. And uh, maybe compare, uh, maybe I can add to that question, maybe compared to the later years of, let's say, post-2000, uh, would, would, your, would your preparations change at all? I don't think we use informants that much nowadays, but uh, no, did, it, did it change at all? Um, well, certainly I don't use informants anymore because my informants are now uh, 30 years old. Yeah. But... Um, Occasionally, I, occasionally I will look at look at something like um, 
chess base or a similar similar chess database. Uh, particularly if I'm playing in, a, in an important tournament, I'll try and find some games played by my opponents and uh, try and anticipate what they what they get what they get to do. All right. Okay. Thanks, Charles. Um, we've got a question here that. Uh... Um, one of our viewers from India uh, asks everybody, Charles, um, and the question is, uh, who is uh, your favorite Indian chess player? <laughs> okay, well, for me, for me, it would have to be Vishy. Okay. Um, I mean, it's an obvious choice, but, but it's, it's an easy choice. Yes. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, in fact, someone said in the chat box, uh, why are you asking this question every time? It's obviously fishy. Everybody says fishy. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. Um, let's see. This one is from Earl. How many GMs did you beat and who was the strongest? Oh, dear. That's an embarrassing question. I don't think I've beaten <laughs> any GMs. All right, all um, right. <laughs> so that, 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 that's, a sh that's a short answer. Um, yeah, of course, but Yuvnar is also there in the symbol, you said. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, also from Kasi. Kasi is asking, which chess books groomed your playing style um, or books you started uh, with studying? Okay. Well, when I, when I first um, started studying chess, um, I found a lot of Fred Reinfeldt in the library. And mm. um, I had to eventually graduate from Fred Reinfeldt, but but um, I would say that he, he taught me some stuff. Um, and also there was a thing called, a thing by Irving Chernoff called the 100 Greatest Games of Chess or something like that. Okay. And I, I really enjoyed that one. Nice. Okay, guys, I hope you're taking notes. And um, next one well, is... Old books. Uh, aha. Uh, old books are, are also actually yeah, I'm good. Not sure, I'm not sure I'd even recommend Fred Reinfeldt, actually. But that, that was just what there was most of. All right, all right. <laughs> uh, we've got another s a short question here from uh, Skanda. Um, according to you, is online chess best or live chess? Uh, you can't really choose between the two. Um, online chess is wonderful because it's, because it's so convenient, because you can play any time. But um, live chess has, has got a certain magic. And yes. It's about... It's about meeting people and um, competing face to face. It's, uh, it's like saying, you know, is real life better than virtual life? Uh -huh. Fully it's agree. Like, well, it's not better than the other, but um, uh, nowadays we have both. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, now there's a couple of uh, uh, nice comments here from uh, uh, Kenny Wellenberg is in the chat saying, Charles, a uh, legend exclamation. Uh, Duke Simons, uh, says true legend and gentleman of the game. Thanks guys for the comments. Um, and then Kenny has a question here. Charles, okay, no, I think that's still a statement, but I think your question is coming. Kenny Willenberg also says, uh, Charles four pawn, pawns attack was my most feared line to face against. To have black against Charles back in the day was like climbing a mountain. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kenny. Um, ML has a question. ML says, who do you consider your toughest opponent internationally? Um, and locally, and why? Well, I don't have any any kind of regular opponent internationally, as you probably gathered. I, I'm not. Um, I haven't travelled with chess for, for quite some time, and um, even when I did travel, it, it was a, it was very much a, an occasional thing. I would travel for maybe an Olympiad, and then maybe one one event in between Olympiads. So it's a, that might be a, a span of four years, or two, two years, sorry, but between them, yes. But um, locally, uh, I've had lots of tough opponents. At uh, one stage, um, Vic Krohn was a, was a very tough opponent. Um, David Friedgood, of course, because, but I probably played him less often. And uh, Dion Solomons has been, a, has been a tough opponent for me. Okay. Um, but, but there are quite a, quite a few of them. <laughs> Increasing <laughs> numbers, actually. <laughs> All right, interesting stuff. Thanks, Charles. And um, 
Yeah, here's one from Kenny. I think um, Kenny says, Hi, Charles. What are your thoughts on establishing a long-term Grandmaster Development Program? Is it possible for SA to create another GM? Of course. Hi. Yes, hi, Kenny. Um, I, I think that's certainly possible. Um, all we need is the, is the, the, the sort of the money and the willpower. Um, but they did, they did something like that in England uh, many years ago after the um, the Shostakovich match, um, they found a found a, a sponsor, and he put a lot of money into developing English chess players. And they, they they then they found some they found some new grandmasters like Miles, and they and they developed some existing strong players like Keen and Steen, and um, probably missing out all sorts of well, there were lots lots of others as well, of course. But they, they created a whole generation of really strong chess players, and that's that's what you need. Uh, it's not enough to have one one good player. Um, particularly if that good player then then pushes off overseas. Um, I mean, no, no no reflection on 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 Kenny that that he has pushed off overseas. I quite understand. I would have done the same. But um, you need a, a a core of really strong players who who stay in place and. Um, they they become then the 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 bedrock of the of the chess establishment. Mm. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's one or two more questions that I just want to ask, and then here's a uh, one or two statements uh, from Dr. Queenie. Dr. Queenie also a regular on the show. Welcome, um, Dr. Queenie says I played against Charles about two years ago. It was such an honor. He was a humble and friendly opponent, also a real gentleman. I enjoyed the experience. It's good to have legends like Charles who still play actively and who we can learn from. Thanks, Dr. Queenie, for the nice words. Um, and Monster Frick. Monster Frick says, Charles, you appear to be this uh, very calm, kind, relaxed, and uh, introverted person at over-the-board tournaments. What is actually going on in your mind? What sort of conversation could one expect to have with you when you are approached by a friendly greeter? Okay, a deep question there by Monster Frick. Um, over to you, Charles. Well, I, I think that's a really hard question for me to answer. I think I think you'd have to ask somebody who's actually tried it. Um, <laughs> See whether they found they found me approachable or not. Um, I would like to be approachable, but it's not it's not really my um, call. I, I, I can't I can't judge my own personality. I think that's something that other people have to do. Yes. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah. And that, then we had a couple of people, couple of people saying hi. The roller coaster said hi. Um, Brapella, Johannes Mabusela also says good evening, guys. Just marking the register. Welcome, uh, Johannes. Uh, Kithonski, of course, Keith Komalo says, sorry, I'm late. He's over there. Um, and then let's let's give one more question and then I think I'll switch over to you, Lyndon. Um, sure. So King Ulster says, uh, for Charles, what would you say was the waiting for your natural aptitude and hard uh, grafting work? The waiting. Um, I would say that it was... I don't... <laughs> I really, um, I can't claim to have worked hard. I can't, I can't claim an enormous natural aptitude. I think there are other, other people who have much more aptitude than I do. I'd have, I have, we've had some really, really uh, promising young players in South Africa in, in, over the years. And a lot of them have, have given up chess for one reason or another. Um, but I don't think I, I can say that I've had a natural aptitude for it. I did have an enthusiasm for it. Um, and I think the number of years that I've played is probably evidence of that. But um, hard work, I don't think that's really in my nature. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Charles. So yeah, th uh, once again, thanks to all the, the questions, guys. I think there's a couple more in the chat box, but we are... I think we have to move on a bit. Maybe at the end, if there's anything left, we can we can still ask some questions. But thanks, Charles. Uh, over to you, London. Thanks, uh, Calvin. And yes, the viewers certainly had some interesting questions for for Charles. And uh, I must just tell the viewers that yes, Charles is approachable. And uh, I mean, Charles and I have analyzed many many games uh, uh, together. And um, Charles has has no problems helping if you if you 
if you are a friendly greeter, as that one person asked there, <laughs> Charles, you've you've played thousands of games, and uh, tonight we we've said that we would like to invite you to show us any one of those memorable, historical, any of those games that that you've played over the over the years. So, what have you prepared for us tonight? Okay, well, I thought I'd show you show you a game from 1980. Not um, that super. It goes back a bit. But um, it was a good tournament for me. It was a, it was a South African closed. Um, and we had um, a couple of international masters. Well, actually, uh, yeah, I think, I think we, had, we had Kreidman and Haman. Um, okay. And I managed to beat Haman and draw with Kreidman. All right. Um, what do we do? And tied, tied for first in the tournament with Haman. But uh, the game I want to show you was actually against you and Cromwell, who's a, uh, an Eastern Province player. Interesting yeah. stuff. Um, uh, so, sorry to cut you off there. Uh, just apologies, Charles. I was about to say yeah. there, Lyndon was gone, but he's back. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Lyndon is back now. Right. Uh, okay. Thanks, Charles. You said you and Cromwell. Uh, uh, just, just to add, I grew up in, in, in uh, Eastern Province, so... Um, I had to travel okay. maybe an hour and a half uh, weekends to, to go and play in a, a, a Port Elizabeth event. And Ewan was the, the big, you know, when you're playing, at, I don't know if you guys played TV games yet. Or, you know, when you fight in a fighting game, Ewan is the big boss at the, on the final yeah. stage that you have to play. So, okay. I'd, like, I'd love to see this one. <laughs> okay. So, so are we going on to the lead chess platform, uh, Calvin? Yeah, we are already at the chess board. So we are ready to Great. go. Super. Okay, so this is um, where was this tournament? Was in Port it was in fact in Port Elizabeth. This tournament. Okay. Um, okay, so I had white. I played d four. Knight f six. C four. C five. D five. Um, sorry, Charles. Is it possible for you to to lower your your lead chess volume? Because I can we try had, and do that. Uh, if you go yep. to the bottom right uh, and you right click on your your audio settings, I think if you uh, go mm -hmm. right click on your audio and then open volume mixer, there should be a. Uh, uh, bottom right. I'm looking for it. Um, because we can hear like uh, I hear a couple of banging of pieces, mine it's and it's yours, it's and it's so it's on. Business. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I can't actually see see this thing on the bottom right. I can see something that says friend, friends online. Um, okay, you know what? What I'm going to do is I'm going to lower my volume for of, of leeches. Okay. Then then we, they can't hear my volume. Yeah, Just hang on a yours. second. Yeah, then it's not at least too much uh, chess sorry, pieces. I'm, with I'm looking, for, looking for my for my volume for for but I don't know. No, no worries. I think I'm I'm sorting it out my side. Okay. All right. Okay, let's let's continue. And by the way, uh, Roland Willenberg is also in the house. He says, hi, Charles and panel. Welcome, Roland. And um, hi, Roland. Earl says, uh, you're playing Mr. Muscle, um, <laughs> uh, Charles. <laughs> All yes. right. So it's, so you and playing a Benoni. Intimidating. It seems the, um, the, 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 the big guy, the big guy in the room. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you know what? I don't know if uh, if uh, does my memory if my memory serves correctly. I saw you and this one time. This was many years ago. I saw you and wearing a t a, a, a sh t shirt. Um. Okay. His shoulders was very oh, much open, but the t shirt had a chessboard on the back of the t shirt, and uh, a chessboard, and it said, "If if you want to play me, I'd have to take off my shirt." <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw one like that before. But uh, anyway, let's let's continue. So e6. This is the kind of thing. Yes, e6, knight c3. Okay. I'm afraid I've been playing the four pawns attack far too long. <laughs> actually, actually, I learned the four pawns attack from from Basha Kwaki um, oh, when I was Kwaki. in France. Um, he was the the local champion in Grenoble, and um, we played hundreds and hundreds of blitz games with the four pawns attack. And I started started learning it there from both sides. Um, okay. Well, now Kenny Willenberg knows where it comes from. Yep. Okay, takes okay. d5. Assuming point, point d6, yeah. 
E4. Uh, sorry, we still got the double double click thing. No worries. It's, uh, it's, it's minor no, no issues. No issues. E6. Okay, so here it comes, F4. Aha, so we're back into four okay. points. Okay. Right. Bishop G7. Okay, now there's this funny line where white gives check. Okay. And it turns out that um, there are some very tricky lines where black plays a natural move like bishop d7 or knight d7. But the theoretically the correct move is to play the knight back to d7. Yes. Or yes. Because other other moves allow white to play e5. Yeah. And uh, things get quite scary for that. Even yeah. Um, okay, so I've got this line that is not very common. I believe it has been played before. In fact, we'll see here. Okay, um, yes, there have been a few, a few uh, recent examples. Duda played played it against Pokratov and won. Okay. Um, okay, Duda's got a rating of twenty-seven fifty-eight, so I guess it can't be that bad. Yeah. Yeah, it can't be. <laughs> so, so you're okay. referring to Bishop E two. Bishop E two, yes. Okay. The idea is to try and um, forestall Black's plan of A six and B five. When he uh -huh. plays a6, we can play a4 and stop yeah. him. Okay. Meanwhile, we forced his knight back to what we hope is an inferior square where it, it kind of gets in the way. Yeah. Um, so, right, black carried on quite logically. Knight came to f3. Um, knight to a6. Okay, so the knight can't come out to d7. Oh, of course, the worst thing to do here is to play knight f6. Yeah, then you're... Four pawns attack with an extra tempo. Extra tempo, yes, interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, four yeah. pawns attack is scary enough as it is. Yes, I think uh, you, yeah. you don't need you don't need to give, give white an extra tempo for it. Okay, um, so you played knight a six, which is sensible. Uh, <clears throat> castles, knight c seven, uh, a four. Okay, that's maybe not quite necessary yet, but because he's not yet threatening b5, but apparently I played a4. All right, uh, black, I beg your pardon, he played black, played the rook e8. Okay. Mm. okay, so this is this is all fairly standard looking stuff. Yeah. Um, mm. The person who's annotating this, I think is David Walker, who was a very strong player of, of the time. Um, and his comment is that rookie eight maybe doesn't fit in all that well with black with this, this current situation. Okay. Uh, the reason is that ultimately white, it's rookie eight is a very natural move. I yes. Mean, actually, mm. everybody plays it, and it even seems to threaten the pawn. Um, could, because black could th theoretically play bishop takes e three and then rook takes e four, but um, in practice, people tend not to do that. Because yeah. they don't want to give up, give up that dark square bishop. And yeah. Yeah. if you if you do that and then white plays c c4 followed by bishop b2, then I think black is going to have a, a lot of suffering to do. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And of move. course, knight g5 and pawn to a5 immediately exposes the king sign. Yes. All these all these things can be can be quite alarming for black. So he usually doesn't want doesn't want to get, get involved in such a thing. So I can I can afford to ignore him, which I do. I play King H one. Okay. Okay. Because sooner or later there is going to be a check on that on that open diagonal, and mm. basically it's it's meant to be a waiting move. I'm waiting to see what he's going to do. Is he going to play Knight F six? Then I will play, play E five with great gusto. Um, is he going to take my pawn? Then okay, I can live with that. Yeah. Um, because as I said, the C four and Bishop B two plan is going to be very strong. Um, mm. So where are we? He played b6, which is probably a little bit slow. Okay, black has to get going on the queen side. Given that he can't can't do anything constructive on the king side, he can't play knight f6. Um, yeah. B5. So he might as well get going on the queen side. I, I think he should maybe go straight for a6 and then b5. So even what he's worried about, I think, is that I might play after a6, I might play a5. Yeah. That's that's yeah. okay. I think black gets plenty of, plenty of play that way. Mm. Um, even if black then plays b5, he gets a slightly compromised 
Creedside pawn structure, but um, he also gets some play for his pieces, which is right. he's definitely going to want to want to get. Okay, so, so a six of rook b eight would have been better in that position. I'm sorry. A six and a six and a rook b eight, and even a6. if you do play a five, then the rook can still put pressure yeah. on the b file. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I came up with this plan of bishop d two. Okay, well, which it seems has never been played before. Um, and the idea is to bring the bishop around to h4. Um, so if black doesn't do something fairly effective now, um, I'm hoping to take advantage of the of the slowness of black's play. Yes. If I can get my bishop to h4, then uh, I think bad things are going to start happening to the to the black king side because right. there's very short space there. Okay. Um, all right. So b6, bishop d2, rook b8, question mark. Okay. Okay, another natural looking rook move uh, with another question mark. Yes. But it's just it's just too slow. Um, I think this was the moment to play knight f6, in fact, because right now my d4, d4 is under defended. So I might be forced to play something like queen c2. Okay. Right. Just to hold my equal. Um, and that would be annoying for me because I'd, I'd, I'd much rather have my queen on d1 at the moment. Okay. Where it's supporting supporting the d pawn, and um, yeah, the, the, this is the this is the drawback of having the bishop on d2. Uh -huh. so I don't I don't have knight d2 at the moment, which is the more natural way to, to defend my yes my e pawn. And of course, I can't afford to if if you were to take on e on e4 with the knight, it would be a very different very different story. It's mm. not. It's not entirely clear because I've still got still got some play with Bishop D three and F five and so on, but um, it's at least he keeps his dark, dark square Bishop, which is which is vital in this current position. Yeah. Yes. Um, bishop E one. Okay. Well, now I'm ready for Knight F six. I can just go Bishop H four, or I can even go E five. I like that Bishop maneuver. Bishop is maneuvering it's, its way to King side. Is coming. Ah. Uh, so he played a6. He's not going to be deterred. He's going to carry on with his plan. Bishop h4. Okay, now I don't, f6 is, is just a really bad move. Oof. Yeah, it looks f6 look ug, uh, looks ugly. I guess he has to play bishop, bishop f6 or what? I think, I think right now I can play. I can just play e5 anyway. Yeah, but f6 and, e5. Give up. I'll give up a pawn, but my pawn's coming to d6. My bishop's coming to c4. Uh, that can, can, open. can we just uh, show this quickly? Um, f6, e5 with a spin over there. Um, right. Probably something like that. Are you taking right. on e5 again or are you pushing d6 maybe? I think I'll probably push, push d6 right now. And you've got lots of compensation here. That's d5 square. Knight, the bishop yeah. can get to c4. Lots and, and lots of play. The only sensible square for, for that black knight is e6, after which I just capture again on, on e5. e5 and, and then... Can't even recover his pawn. Beautiful. Pawn. Yeah, so that's, that will be horrible. Yeah. f6 definitely not playable. Uh, so bishop f6 is the only move. Okay. Um, where are we? Okay, so bishop g3. Okay. Yeah, I tend to just bring the bad square. Yes. We might rather be able to get the knight there, but the, the bishop is, is in the wrong place. Uh, mm. He goes away. Bishop g7 again. But now I'm ready for the fight. Yeah, you've, you've planned it now. You've got the knight and a bishop on that square, and of course, pawn to d6 coming. Okay. I could still I could still lose a pawn here, but I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, it mm. depends very much on what happens now. Okay, so, so, so uh, Charles, I, I just have a question for you. Um, right. So, of course, in this structure, e5 is our thematic uh, breakthrough in this structure. Um, but yes. maybe for the viewers, how do you sense the timing in this? Because, I mean, uh, could you not have built, uh, built up a bit more? Maybe queen d2 and rook d1 or rook e1 and something and then e5? Or do you feel like, uh, or, or why now e5? I think uh, I, like, I like e5 now, uh, partly because he will eventually get round to playing b5. Yes. 
Um, so if I don't play it now, I'll probably have to play it next move before before that knight come before that pawn comes and chases my knight away. And then yeah, then you lose the corrupted knight actually wants to go to d5 at some point. So timing is still important here. Yeah. Um, so knight, knight wants to go to d5 or to e4. I mean after yes. this move, my, my immediate threat is knight e4. Aha, uh -huh. okay. When the, the knight is really going to come thundering into, into the black position. All right, so uh -huh. go to e5. Or even bishop h4, of course, could be a strong strong move again now. Okay, so he took it. And now d6. So again, he's got this dilemma. He doesn't want to put his knight on a8. Um, so he has to put it on e6. Yeah. But now I hold my pawn and I have this tremendous pawn, pawn structure in the center. Wow. Um, actually, he can't even play b5 anymore uh, because he would lose a pawn. It might be might be his best best idea, but but the main idea, as as Calvin said, is is the binary is coming to d five, and yeah, just, just goes like e seven. Um, so yes. things are things are looking a bit grim. Beautiful. So he comes up with the idea of f five, which is mm, probably not great, but at least it, it's active. It's he's threatening to go f four and then and then take my pawn. But unfortunately, okay. it does it does allow a bit of a sacrificial sacrificial finish. Okay. Play bishop h4. Bishop goes back to h4. Back for more. Yeah. Back for more. Um, but now, of course, he doesn't have doesn't have anything to put in the way. Oof. So G5 is G5 is absolutely forced, and now I can take it. So that I can sack sack the knight. Okay. Um, knight takes. After, this is getting very. Very scary for him because after knight takes, rook takes. H6, um, maybe. Comes to c5. The knight could come to e4. Oh, yeah. Oh, it, yeah. Um, oh. If, for example, if not, uh, if then h6, then I can simply um, give a check. Check with the bishop or? Check with the bishop, say. Yeah. And then after the king moves, um, we are going to have some serious, sorry, I was actually going to put it on h7, I think. Ah, uh, h7. Okay. But it doesn't, I don't think it really matters at this stage, because I did go bishop takes, and queen h5 check, and rook f7 check, and all, all kinds of bad things are happening. Oof. Yeah. Rook f7 check coming next, yeah, complete domination on the light squares. Um, right, so. Nice, okay so, okay. so I guess knight takes is not possible. Knight takes knight is not possible, so he tries this. Knight f8 think, or something? I don't know. Um, you went knight takes e5. I think ah. if, he, if he plays passively here, then it's it's all over. Yes. Um, he can't he can't afford to just give. I mean, at the very least, I could play something like knight f3 again. And yes. Lost a battle. But I think rook takes f5 is going to be killing instead. I just go rook takes f5, my bishop is coming to c4, my queen is coming to h5. Um, he's got no compensation whatsoever. And I, I just won two pawns. Yeah. So knight takes e5 was played. Knight takes e5. It's more in the spirit of let's complicate things here. Yes. Um, so I went rook takes f5. So clearly. Capturing on g5 is not get, doing any good. Um, he played knight d4 once again, going for activity. Yes. Rook takes e5. Ooh. Sure. Okay. Well, no, things are things are just falling into place for white here. Um, I'm seeing bishop c4 maybe coming up as well in the f7 square. Bishop c4, and, yes, and as soon as the bishop gets to c4 with a check when the queen is, yes. queen is free. That's great, you removed the knight that was actually defending that square. That's right. Um, mm. So he went bishop takes, I think. Bishop checks. King here. Queen h5. And mm. that's a really, um, really bit sad. He played yeah. bishop f5. At least he's holding his h pawn. Um, now I managed a little bit of a finish here. 
right, F7. Uh, where does this queen go? He went queen C8. And now bishop F6 check. Oof. Nice. Oh, didn't see wow. that. Bishop F6 check. Yes. So what's the um, idea here? Okay, so if king takes F6, then queen G5 is just made. G5 is made. Wow, that's a beauty. Okay, let's let's show it for the viewers. King takes and queen g5 is actually mate, guys. Okay, and so, and um, bishop he takes. Have any, he has to, has to go bishop takes. Yeah. But then I got queen h6 check. Um, how does this go? King g8. King g8. Okay, I have a discovered check with the quick with the knight with the knight, but I don't really need that because I've got queen takes f6. And that's threatening mate in two ways. Oof. Wow, queen h8 and knight h6. It's like yes. a, a scissors, scissors move so over there. He actually played rookie six. I don't think it makes any difference. Uh rookie six, but then mate. knight h6. Yeah. Wow, beautiful. So well done, Joel. Yeah, that bishop f6 is uh it's a it's a beautiful move. You won't uh, look at that immediately, but um, I, think, I think I think White is White is probably winning in that position anyway. But um, it was quite a nice little finish. Yes, I do want it in style like that. And Isvan is also in the chat. Uh, uh, Isvan Jonji, and uh, he oh, says, "Wow, Bishop F six did not see that." Nice, Charles. Um, welcome, yeah. guys. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's that's beautiful stuff. Uh, so so. Bishop f6, so you couldn't do queen h6 check immediately. It wouldn't well, have can. the same same effect, so to speak. It's I mean, a lot less forcing, yes. Yeah, so uh, still, I like that. Wow. I think you'll still win uh, with knight, knight takes e5 check and bishop f6 check and so on, but uh, I liked I like. Yeah, this is very display. forceful and just uh, yeah, no. advancing. <laughs> Yeah, oh, great, great game there, Charles, because you, sacri you sacrificed the exchange and then you gave up this bishop to, to force this position uh, effectively as well. Yeah. So, I mean, and of course, pawn to e5, Calvin. And then, and, 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 yeah, the thematic e5 thrust. And I just want to mention before the final move uh, that Black played rook e6, I mean, look at the, the two rooks. The rook is still on e8 with a question mark on its head, and the rook is still on b8 with a question mark on his head. Um, okay, I'm being a bit uh, harsh there with those moves, but of course it was the timing, like you he said. He didn't play b5. Yeah, he didn't get in b5, <laughs> yeah. So. All, that, all that preparation. Yeah, very beautiful yeah. game. Topical stuff, guys. If you want to know how to play these structures, definitely take a look at uh, Charles de Villiers games. Um, he knows a thing or two about this. So yeah, thanks, thanks so much, Charles. Beautiful game. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And and Charles, would you be uh, available at some stage to show us a few more games uh, uh, when you have some time in December? Uh, yes, I suppose so. It should, I've got now, now that I've now that I've done some research, I've, I've managed to find a few of my games. Uh, <laughs> and difficulty with deciphering the score sheets. So um, <laughs> the ones that have been published rather than the, the ones that I, I just got in my own records. No, no, Charles. Then, then, Calvin. I think we should invite uh, uh, Charles back one uh, one Saturday or so uh, to show us some of these games because not only are they historical, they're also memorable, and one can learn quite a lot from them as uh, as well. And and Charles, I dare say that uh, you were very attacking in this position, as you said uh, earlier in in the interview. Um, yes. Well, at at. at... I suppose I don't very often play um, such attacking games now, but uh, uh, occasionally, occasionally it turns out that the, the old lion has some teeth. Yeah, no, no, for, for yeah, no that, that game Charles, was vicious. And Charles, was it uh, this game? Um, Ewan Kuramod, by the way, says that uh, this game was played in the last round of the 1980 SA Open, and by winning this game, you won the title. Wow. I suppose that's true, yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Just by yeah, the way, <laughs> just by the way, there. So, so uh, no thanks, uh, Ewan, and uh, we'll also uh, at some stage interview him next year as well. Charles, from from my side, uh, it's been great chatting with you. Any uh, last uh, comments to to the viewers out there? How would what what would you say uh, should one be able to do if you want to improve? Say from eighteen hundred to two thousand. They just use that as a as a vantage point. Um, what what would you 
study more, play more? What advice would you give to, to the viewer out there? I think um, you have to do both. You have to study somewhat, but not, not too much. If you, study, if you study too much, you can become quite stale and, and uh, overbooked. Right. Um, I think it's important to have, to have a lot of, lot of practical play, but also to, to learn from your mistakes. If you, if you, once you've played a game, um, you have the wonderful facility of a computer that will tell you afterwards, don't take it too literally, uh, half, a, half a pawn on a computer is not much. It's not, the computer can be wrong easily by half a pawn. But once it gets more than that, um, if they point out, if a computer points out a blunder, then you need to take that on board and, and, and learn from it. Right. No, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Charles, on that. Charles, do you still have five minutes to take two or three questions from the chat room? Sure. Okay. Uh, Calvin, let's let's end uh, uh, our session with two or three questions from the chat room that you may not have asked earlier. Okay. Let's uh, let's get uh, the questions going here. Um, where was I when I left the questions? Um, Okay, so yeah, we've got a question earlier from, from Sally Mash. Sally Mash was asking, uh, best opening for beginners as black and for white, please. <laughs> really, that's, that's so much a matter of personal choice. It depends yes. are you, you know, if, you want to be, if you want to play exciting games or if you want to play logical, calm games. Um, I guess if you want I, to play I, exciting I, games that I can recommend the Four Pawns Attack. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you would rather rather learn um, positional play and you know learn how to play like a grandmaster, then then probably it's better to to um, do something like uh, learn something like the Queen's Gambit. It's it has a, a rather boring reputation, but actually there's a lot of lot of subtlety and, and beauty in it. Um, right. And it's, there's a tremendous amount that one can learn. What particularly, I mean, from the games of Capablanca, one can learn a great deal about how to play the Queen's Gambit and how to play positional chess in general. Sure. Okay, great stuff. Uh, thanks. And uh, we've got a question here from Sean Willenberg as well. Welcome, Sean. Uh, he says, um, "Hi, Charles. Nice to see you. What do you do for relaxation?" <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose I. Play online chess for relaxation, um, but I'm certainly not playing seriously at the moment. Um, other than that, uh, I've been watching a lot of the American elections, which is not, <laughs> actually not all that, all that relaxing either. It's three guys in my blood. And um, Netflix, that sort of thing. Ah, uh, okay, right, good. cool. Queen's Gambit. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So, um, yeah, next question from Monster Frick. Um, Monster Frick says, Charles, looking back when you achieved the title of FIDE Master, what did it mean to you? Was it a wow, a personal acknowledgement for, for your hard work or just something that must have um, some point happen, something that happened at some point? Well, you know, obviously at that stage, I was, I was hoping, hoping for a, a, an international master title. Uh, but it didn't. It didn't happen, and um, the FIDE Master title was just a nice um, consolation prize, if you like. Um, it was. It's. It's. It's good. Good to have a title because um, it makes you feel that you've you've accomplished something. Um, but I would still rather have had the the IM title. Um, yeah, I don't know. We also get it. Yes, yes. No, I I share the sentiment over there, Charles. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I uh, I think that's about it for the questions. I believe there's a couple more statements I'd want to read here. Um. So uh, yeah, Doctor Queenie says awesome finish to a great game. Roland says stunning game with brilliant tactics. Uh, Duke Simon says great game. Um. King Ulster says, whoa, heavy. Appreciate sharing that puzzle. Subtle and slow initiative building. Beautiful timing and momentum. It sounds like King Ulster is writing uh, chess papers. 
beautiful <laughs> uh, exclam- um, descriptions there by King Ulster. Um, ML says, uh, always admired your in-game play. Can you recommend any material or method to prepare this area? Um, well, something I've come across quite recently um, is there's, there's a book called um, 100 Endgames You Must Know. And I think, I think that's the first, first step to any kind of endgame study um, right. because they cover in a reasonably accessible way, they cover the, the real essential essentials of endgames. Um, you can, I think you can learn a tremendous amount from that. I, I've certainly learned something from it, and and uh, I think um, it's got a. <coughs> once you once you know your basic end games, then you can start getting into the, the, the real subtleties, um, understanding you know how to play end games in general. But but um, to do that, you first have to learn your times tables, which is which is what that book is about. Okay, nice one, guys. Um, uh, 100 in uh, basic in games, you said, um, Charles. One, it's one, no, it's 100 in games. You, you need to know it's by Grandmaster uh-huh. Jesu de la Villa. Thank you, thank you. All right. Um, ah, by Jesus, is that that's a relatively new one, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. relatively new one, okay. two years old. All right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, f- 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 a few final comments here. Roland says, Charles, do you... Oh, a question from Roland. Charles, do you keep stats on your games with opponents? Which SA player have you faced the most? Okay, so Roland, I think, missed the, the, the early part of the show, perhaps. <laughs> so, uh, yes. is there anyone else you yeah. have in mind, or or is it... No, well, now, that, now that I've heard, heard from Lyndon, I think he, he has to be my most frequent opponent. Yes. Uh, I think uh, you said okay. 35 games, eh? 35 on my database without counting of weapons and blitz. Uh-huh. And he's got the records to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then the final statement here by Grey Old Wizard. Um, Thank you for another brilliant reflection celebrating a true legend. Thanks for the comment, Grey Old Wizard. So, th- uh, thanks everybody for your comments and your questions. And um, yeah, I, I'll, uh, Lyndon, I'll just grab this opportunity to also say. Um, just to say thanks um, to you for hosting the, event, uh, the the show again. And thank you sure. to our special guest, uh, Fede Master Charles de Villiers. It's been an honor to host you on my channel. Um, yeah, uh, I think uh, there's uh, there's so much we can learn from him, guys, till this point. Go and filter his games. I've done it before. I've sat uh, uh, opposite him. And uh, I must say, sweat. Uh, uh, I had to sweat a lot of times. I must confess, probably a lot of times I get into trouble against him. So, um, yeah, that's why the reason why I, I, I like the the way he plays. So, so do check out his games, a true SHS legend. So, thanks so much for joining us, Charles. Thanks, thanks, Calvin. It's been it's been great, and it's been a, been a, a, an honor to be to be on on your channel. And uh, thanks, Lyndon, for your um, friendly questions. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, Charles. And just from my side, uh, um, to all the viewers out there, um, I probably have played Charles, as I said, about 35 times. So I've played Charles quite a lot over the board. And uh, it's great to, when you know you, you've got to play your your hardest. You've got to give your best because any move could be a losing move. And I think, Charles, uh, the respect that we as players have for you and what you brought to the game, we know that we can only learn from going through your games and anybody that wants to study South African chess and wants to be a better player uh, can do no wrong in studying the games of Charles de Villiers uh, from the early 70s right up until 20, 2019. <laughs> so Charles, thank you very much from my side. It's uh, great knowing you as well. Calvin, uh, over to you. All right, so guys, well, just final words here. Um, yeah, before I ask Lyndon the final question, one thing I can just add as well. One, I, I for a couple of years when I came to Cape Town, I actually stayed at Lyndon's house. And uh, Lyndon, we lost your view over there. Just make sure your camera is uh, is okay. Um, cool. But uh, yeah, Lyndon told me as well as a youngster, just after school, I came to Cape Town and um, trying to establish myself as a player. And then Lyndon said, Calvin, just remember, if you want to establish yourself as a top player, you must get past a few guys. And Charles, Charles's name popped up there as well. You must get past Charles in order to become a strong chess player. So I learned from an early age here in Cape Town that he's one of the guys you need to face to establish yourself. Um, so yeah, and... Um, so next week 
we have someone special, uh, a special guest. Um, Lennon, can you tell us who that special guest is? Calvin, the special guest next week will be Dr. Queenie, a lady who has won the South African Close Championship three times. And uh, we'll be looking forward to interviewing Women International Master, Dr. Denise Bauer. Aha, so we've got Dr. Queenie in the house. Um, uh, WI am Denise Bauer and lots and lots of uh, things we can learn from her as well. So looking forward to this one. And uh, like I said, this evening's uh, show is the third last one the second last uh, show next week guys don't miss out 7 p.m usual time um thanks for everybody for tuning in thanks for the comments um tell your friends about the show and make sure to press the follow button um yeah what i see one more comment here master Frick says thank you charles for allowing this opportunity to share a great game by you and answering our questions thanks master Frick. All right, enjoy the rest of your evening, guys. Thanks so much uh, to the viewers as well. Enjoy your evening, guys. Okay, thanks, guys. See you next time. Cheers, cheers. Bye.